I mean, first of all, the PFO statute is a weapon for the prosecutors. I think there's an initial problem with the, with, with, with the PFO statute because the prosecutors have so much power and it gives them so much leverage to negotiate, uh, even with weak crimes. Well, the law itself uh, was enacted in, on January 1st, 1975, when Kentucky penal, current penal code went into effect. The theory behind persistent felony offender status is the repeat offenders that continue to come back into the criminal justice system, recidivism, uh, that they would be punished more harshly for repeat offenses. A persistent felony offender charge uh, can be used to, uh, you know, to help motivate somebody to enter a guilty plea because um, they could possibly face a longer sentence. PFO basically are habitual criminal statutes. Well, Kentucky used to have a habitual criminal act, right? So, the, so all it did was enhance the habitual criminal act back in 1974. With all of those acts about enhancing criminal penalties that were enacted too close to the Jim Crow era, uh, to me, were all Jim Crow laws. So to the extent that the PFO is, a, is feeding off of the habitual criminal act, it, it, it's just the same. All they did was modernize the habitual criminal act. Here's the problem with the PFO. Anytime they see a criminal law bill, they jump on it. They, everybody's for being tough on crime. You're never gonna find somebody say, oh, we like criminals. Uh, so everybody wants to get tough on the criminals and what they do is they get too tough on them or they get unjustly tough on them. And that's, that's the failure of the PFO. And we flooded the prison system. Boom, we get them and, and they're all of a sudden looking at serving out the rest of their life in prison. That wasn't what it was designed for, but it, the legislature set it up wrong. The last 25 years, you will probably see the most egregious abuse of the PFO statutes with drug charges and drug convictions and you can do 20 years just for possessing fentanyl or a piece of crack. And you know, back then there was no consideration as to whether you were an addict or not. That didn't start until the white communities began to get addicted. It cost a lot of money to keep a guy in for a year. I mean, it, uh, years ago, it was over $50,000 to keep a guy in for a year. So you're spending all that money. You're not doing anything for him. You're warehousing him. What good's that do anybody? When you think about a cost of uh, approximately $30,000 a year in prison for someone who's written bad checks or committed a lower level theft crime and you enhance it through PFO sentencing and all of a sudden somebody who maybe committed a one to five year crime is now looking at 10 years, 10 years, um, of incarcerations, $300,000. I think the future is looking pretty grim because you have a very conservative state here, which is getting more conservative probably by the minute. And they love those tough sentences, being hard on crime. And I think you're gonna see much more of that. I think you're gonna see more bills like the PFO bill.
probably the most important thing they could do would be to eliminate the PFO2 law so that you don't you know, you don't get that automatic jump up for, for a second offense, which basically doubles all of the punishments. So get, eliminate that. But then in addition to that, go back to that original provision that would not allow them to count a felony for persistent felony offender purposes unless he'd been in prison. So that the PFO law could not be used against anybody except someone who'd been in prison, once released, put back in prison twice, released, and then committing the third offense. If they do that, it would make a huge difference in the inmate numbers that now exist. I think it ought to be limited to crimes or convictions for violent crimes, because I think really that's what it was intended for. System restructuring is, 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 is never too old to do it.